Welcome to the Enlighten Up Podcast. I am your host, Nicole Frolic, and I invite you to cozy up with me each week as I explore all aspects of the spiritual journey, spiritual biohacking, and expanding the mind beyond this reality. Remember that the collective awakening can start by planting one seed. So thanks for being such an amazing audience and sharing these shows with your family and friends. So without further ado, let's jump right into the episode and find out what we're discovering today. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Enlighten Up podcast. I am excited to bring back Paul Remington Jones, also known as It's Unslaved Paul, on on his YouTube channel, and you may be following his Telegram channel. It is time to really kind of dive into more of the spiritual, spiritual concepts of common law. I think that it's important. It's an important topic. And Paul, you're like one of the best men I can think about (laughs) to to have this conversation with. Well, that's an honor at this point. (laughs) How, How are you doing today? How have things been since you've been on the show last? Um, well, you know, just, um, doing the day-to-day stuff, um, also kind of working on uh, the federal case situation. But um, yeah, other than that, can't really complain. Yeah, so how how has it been going overall for you? Um, have you been getting any breakthroughs or you've been hitting more walls than you'd like to? Well, since I kind of went full force into this um yeah definitely i don't know what we spoke about last time but uh yeah i have a few officers who work down at the courts who've been there for a while over 20 years and they say that they appreciate what i'm trying to do and they understand now what i'm trying to do and you know i'm in direct contact with them so essentially it's kind of like one place at a time one person at a time we're just kind of you know getting everybody back to the singular understanding of what we're all doing here and how we're going to make this society work desirable for all of us, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's great news. And I think it's right. It's baby steps. You know, we can't expect the change to come in um, at lightning speed, considering how long it took us to get here to this point. (laughs) The journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step, as they say, right? And as you just said, this did not just get like this overnight. This is you know, 50, 100, 200 years, arguably, just within this, the confines of what we call the United States, you know, this is slowly, but surely we've given over our power, right? Nobody's even taken anything from us. We've given over our power. And now it's time to wake up, as they say, rouse ourselves from the hypnosis and reclaim by not giving away, right? We're not taking anything back. We're reclaiming by stopping the action of giving away. Exactly, exactly. And I think there's a level of ownership that some people aren't realizing needs to be taken here. Um, And that's where the power really lies. So there's a there's a few things that I'd like to kind of get started on here. Because for me, learning about this really kind of fell into my lap in December of 2020. And this has been a really interesting journey for me over the last few months, because I'm starting to realize how, you know, I've been going through this awakening process since I was 17. (laughs) And it never amazes me at how much there is still to learn. But this is one area that I really didn't have a lot of awareness about. But at the same time, once I started to become more aware of it, I realized how integral it is to understanding who we are. And I'd like to kind of start there because Remembering who we are is probably, I feel like, one of the, the cruxes of this entire, and what I don't want to call it a movement, but journey back to sovereignty. Sure, yeah, the journey in consciousness, which, again, starts as soon as you come out of your mother's water and as soon as you start being told, you know, and this is kind of an old story, you know, the idea of who you are versus who you you know what your bodily intelligence your emotional intelligence your whatever you want to call it the spiritual intelligence maybe certain parts of your mind are 
bringing certain thoughts and certain things forward and you're told, well, just ignore that or don't look at that or we don't talk about that at the table or however it's done. It's very subtle as we grow up, but it's not even um, sort of, I guess it is, it's a forgetting who we are because we were trained to forget, right? The, the, the whole way that society as it is built continues to operate the way that it's designed is we have to forget. We have to be taught uh, something different to, to, to go down a different path than what our sort of integrated intelligence is bringing forth to us. And that's why we see now we're hitting the resistance because for so long we were acting out what we were trained to act out, which is different from what we were made to be by the universe. And now everything is clashing, right? The you're seeing the resistance because what is written on paper what is told by the groups of men and women to us is, is that plan, right? It's that timeline. It's, it's separate from who we would have been if we never had the TV, the radio, the influences of other individuals telling us who we should be and shouldn't be, right? So now that, that process has to be brought back to the, the source, right? The original intent. And that's why we're seeing all the friction we're seeing now in the corporate world and with this COVID thing, because human beings are going to be forced to be brought back to original intent. That's my belief or understanding or perspective on it. Mm -hmm. No, I agree with you. And I think learn remembering who we are isn't just about, you know, on my channel, we talk a lot about our, um, our heritage in the galaxy and the universe and all universes beyond. But ultimately, this is really about understanding who we are from the origin point of how our creator created us and all of the rights that are bestowed upon us from that creation. And ultimately, I feel like, you know, common law can get very overwhelming to someone when they start looking at it compared to what you think is. And then there's all the different wording and how important the words are and but I think one of the best places to start is at the spiritual, um, at the spiritual point of remembering who you are uh, and understanding the law as it is understood on a spiritual level. Because if you understand that, then I feel like common law starts to kind of fall into place a little easier. Sure. Well, I mean, I'll speak in my own, you know, my own experience. Um, there's a common sense level to the common law, but if you're brought up on, let's say, <clears throat> and again, I don't know how other people's household went, but let's say, well, this is my house. I make the rules, you know, just that whole premise right there is an overthrow of common law because your house is built on the land, which is in the universe, which is subject to law. You don't make the laws in this house because you pay for it and put it on a land. That's not how common law and universal law works, right? So just that one, I don't know if that kind of, you know, reveals yeah. it makes <laughs> sense. You know what I'm saying? But <laughs> it, it really hits home with me because I can't tell you how many times I heard that one. <laughs> sure. And, and again, there's a level to like, you know, we are our parents' property in a sense, right? They are responsible for our upkeep and our maintenance and our protection to a certain point. But the problem we get into, right, and we go back to and everything, the ego. Um, ego is very slippery. It's very subtle. Oftentimes, it makes you believe you're helping when you're hurting. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of like we have to rediscover what it means to be human from day one, like right out of the womb and all the way up. You know, a lot of times I'll ha hear parents tell me, well, you know, they're young. They don't know. You know, they're X, Y, Z. They don't know. I say, well, can you confirm to me that they don't know? Or is that just what you want to be true? Right. Because adults want to be true, that they can do whatever they want around their kids and have no consequences. That's ego. But the reality of it is, I suspect that these children are picking up things from day one. Right. Every little sign, symbol, cue, they're picking it up on some level, you know, and then they start to see the behavior manifest four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years old. And they say, well, you're so wild. You're so crazy. How did you get like this? I think a lot of it is what they were picking up on that you thought that they were ignoring or couldn't understand, you know, and now they're playing it back. They're playing the tape back. 
I 100% agree. And as someone who works with a lot of different people to help them heal from their childhood, I can tell you, it, yeah, they're picking up on stuff. I mean, I, I think as adults, we're trained to disregard the, uh, with, I guess, the awareness that is held within the child. Uh, children are sponges uh, and they just take on everything, not just what they see, but what they feel, what they hear. It, it's, it's everything. And it can, because that's the, those are the, the years where our subconscious is being formed. That's how we set all of the patterns into play for the rest of our lives. Unless we become aware enough to know how to retrain and reprogram our mind and body which can be very long journey, <laughs> depending on um, when you're starting and what you've come from. So, so for, for you, how, what were kind of some of the things that you realized you were not like you thought, like what you thought you were. And when, and then you realized this actually isn't me. Like what were some of the bigger things that really permeated your consciousness at such a deep level that it kind of struck a chord with you? You mean like almost since the beginning or what? <clears throat> yeah, long, well, along your journey, like some of the bigger ones that really hit you and you're like, wow, like almost like an epiphany of that isn't who I am. This is who I am. I've been fed a lie my whole life. Um, I think one of the big ones is well, the breakthrough experience is I am not this body. I don't know if that sort of makes sense to the audience out there or it sounds sort of you know, I get different reactions from people, but I would assume that's based on where they are in their journey inside of their vessel. So yeah, realizing, you know, I am not somebody's um, son, you know, one day I'll not, not really be somebody's father, like realizing I am not the labels and the descriptions that are put on me by other people around me. You know, I am not a citizen right? I am not anybody's subject. I am not all of these levels that you're told directly or indirectly. Well, you are this body. You know, this is who you are. This is the name you are. This is where you're from. All of these levels, right? It's their labels and descriptions about the product, but they are not what the product is, right? So th those are big breakthroughs for me, right? Obviously, when I talk, people will be aware that I am from New York, or somewhere on the East Coast, but that's an experience, right? Being born on Long Island in New York is an experience. It is not who I am, if that makes sense. Oh, yeah, no, that totally makes <laughs> okay, sense. Okay, I'll even take it deeper. Being born in a body as a male, right? That is an experience. That is mm -hmm. not who I am at my truest, deepest, you know, foundational essence, right? Who and what I am is the same as who and what you are from my perspective, right? The form we take on and the functions are not who we are. They're experiences. Yeah, no, I, I, it's, it's very, how, how do I say this? Kind of jarring within the soul, you know, when you really start to realize how many untruths were, were learned <laughs> as truths, uh, you know, masquerading as truths just in our reality through the things that we've learned through our parents, which were probably just things they were told by their parents. And, and you know, it's just this constant um, continuous, continuous cycle of things being fed to us down the line. Because the majority of individuals, when they look outside of their body, <clears throat> Like the Tao says, 4,000 years ago, I believe, we mistake the false for the true and the true for the false. I'm big on that lately. You mm -hmm. know, the idea that everything that we look out and we assume, and they talk about it in certain movies and pop culture like The Matrix. Well, what is real, Neo? You know, the idea of, of form and function versus um, the, the essence of what it is. Like, you know, the idea of we look at the wall, we look at matter, we, we see the shapes and we see, you know, the um, functions and, and we label it. But on the most basic level, from what I understand, and I guess it depends on what you're willing to believe in on the scientific level, but 
from what we understand or what we believe we understand on the quantum physics level, what we see is not what is, right? <clears throat> Just like the idea of a person in law, a person, one of the connotations or the, 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 the definitions is a mask wearer, right? So mm-hmm. essentially everything is a form of manifestation, but manifestation is what is used, right? And what the beingness is, is the non-physical, the non-manifested, right? And the Tao speaks about this as well. We are non-being, but we use being, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To have our experience, you know? Exactly. Because again, once again, the third dimension is an experience. Mm -hmm. What we call the third dimension and earth and it is an experience. It is not the all. Yeah. And we, you know, it's like everything that is unmanifest in the void, we come to this planet to experience manifest that we cannot experience um, in the, let's just call it the womb of um, the cosmos, you know, the, the void, the vastness. And sometimes we forget that, that that's through that experience is how we gain more wisdom, more insight, more knowing. And you've talked about this before too and i'm a, and i'm in complete alignment with it because this is something you realize as you start to kind of saunter off the chosen path that society paves for you uh and you start to make your own path and go a different way uh that you start to realize that there's no kind of education that school can teach you that experience can teach you as the teacher and through our experience we take knowledge and make it like well we turn it into wisdom but we become it and i think that's the most important thing is that you until you experience something you're not you're not even close to becoming it and that's kind of one of the things that i really like about what how you're demonstrating just through you being you you're demonstrating the importance of becoming um you know, ultimately who you truly are and living that, living that day to day. Sure. As, as the ancient, um, one of the ancient proverbs says, as within, so without, as above, so below. So I'm going within to find the the centered space, the most truest, true enough self, right? I, I don't sort of ever really claim anything, really. Maybe there might be a few things I'll say in the absolute sense but everything else i try to take the attitude of true enough you know so i don't care if it comes to common law and rights or whether the earth is flat or any of these discussions that we have right i will i will very rarely say well this is absolutely true this is absolutely false i will say from what i can deduce this is true enough you know it's true enough that i'm inhabiting my body therefore my body is under my control and my dominion therefore my body is under the sovereignty of my I am presence. Nobody outside of that can dictate to me what I shall or shall not do. That's true enough, right? I don't have to tell you who God is or, you know what I'm saying? I, mm-hmm. Like the Tao says again, you cannot know it, but you can be it, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Ab- absolutely. And so through like, and that's one of the things too, I'd love you to comment on this. As you become it and you live it, what sort of shifts have you noticed? Because we, we kind of had this conversation in my um, on my live call last night with my alchemy program, where one of the girls has really taken to demonstrating um, her own autonomy and her own um, truth, and but not from a place of where I think we we've all definitely started at of a place for like fighting for it um, and trying to prove something kind of from a place of resistance as a and and now moving from a place of acceptance that this is just my truth and having a lot of peace and harmony around what that truth is and demonstrating it now not from a place of resistance but acceptance and how that's kind of shifted the experiences that you have outside of you now because you're holding that resonance and that frequency of acceptance that you now don't meet as much resistance because you're not coming from a place of resistance. How has your journey kind of shaped from, you know, you are, you can tell that you have a lot of peace and harmony um, with who you are and what you believe is true. What, like you were just saying, how does that shift your encounters with people 
And what advice can you share with people who are coming from a place of resistance? <clears throat> well, I would say one of the bigger sort of realignments or re reformations, right, that goes on within the self is the realization that I have no control of anything outside of my own beingness. So I'm able to reconcile the quote unquote wrongs and harms done to me because I realize that it's impersonal. It's part of that person's walk and that person's journey. And it has nothing to do with who I am. And there's really nothing I can even do to stop any of it other than once again, be the truest, most compassionate, loving, but yet insistent, right? Rather than resistant, I will be insistent on the idea of upholding the truth and the law. Like you can go ahead and cut my head off. I won't resist, but I will insist as my head is leaving my shoulders and rolling down that this is the truth and this is my experience and what I know. And I cannot waver from that because anything wavering from what I know to be true is selling my soul and my free choice and my cognitive ability that the universe gave me. I cannot sell that out because then I'm subject to the law, right? I, there's two laws running parallel. I'm subject to either man's group of written down earthly laws that change from week to week, year to year, decade to decade. And I'm subject to the laws of creation in the universe, which are eternal and unchanging. So when we go back to the allegory of God is good and the devil is evil, I believe there's a form and function for both and that they work together in order to produce higher levels of consciousness. However, I will go this way, not that way. You know, and that's my personal journey and my choice. So when someone else chooses a different experience for themselves and tries to choose that for me, I understand I'm not going to reflect that back. I'm not going to internalize that as least as possible. I'm going to allow them to do that. I'm going to continue to do this. And, you know, it's kind of like there is no <clears throat> resistance because this is not a this is not this is not my will. This is the will. Right. So there is nothing you can do to me to change what the truth and the will is. All you can do is do wrong to someone who's attempting to do it. Right. Which has nothing to do with me, you know, and I take it back to mm -hmm. kind of the idea of how we learn the walk of Christ or Christ in consciousness. What exactly that is, you know, not as a savior, but as a journey in consciousness. There is you can hang me on the cross. It's not going to make the eternal truth untrue. Yeah, no, I, I, um, I love that. And it's, you know, what you said too before that about the importance of being insistent, uh, not, not resistant, is something that I think a lot of people aren't used to. I think we're so used to just rolling over and complying when it just gets a little bit too difficult. And I think that when someone recognizes someone who's really sticking to their own to the moral and ethical code, like you said, of the universe, you know, of the universal laws, uh, that you just do no harm to, just do no harm. And uh, that I feel that it really starts to shift, um, shift something within someone else if they're ready for it. Obviously not everyone is ready for that. Uh, they're, they've got their own resistance, but I do believe that there are clearly because you're experiencing it, say, down at the courthouse with certain officers and where they're appreciative of it. And I think this is something that unfortunately we have to teach and relearn, uh, remember what it means to uphold and be insistent of our truth that, like you said, is eternal. It's not, it's non-changing, uh, like the laws here <laughs> are. Sure. Well, that's the only way it works, right? The only way that any of this could work, any like conversation where we bring 5,000 people into a room and we talk to them, the only way that that works is if we have a common ground, a commonality, an ability to perceive, like someone says, I see what you're saying. We have a vision and ability to connect and to see what each other is feeling. It's called empathy, right? So yes, not everyone has empathy, so they will not always be able to see and feel what you're seeing and feeling. However, you know, that's kind of like where we have to take this as far as the human experience goes is not having empathy necessarily for 
people's individual truth if it conflicts with the law, right? Like I can have compassion and sympathy and empathy for somebody who has made choices and got a result that has hurt them. However, it's limited because it's like, well, we all make mistakes. We all cause suffering and destruction to ourselves and each other at one point in time in our lives to some degree. And then there's repentance and change. A mistake is only a mistake uh, until you refuse to correct it, right? So it's just about the individual's journey and understanding that the lows give, ways, give way to the highs, and then we can balance out and move forward in a way to co-create for desirable results. But again, you have to remove ego. And the way you remove ego in this life, it seems, and we'll take it back to the Buddha. I use a lot of these same sort of quotes and understandings. Uh, he was asked, well, how does one attain enlightenment? Well, go and suffer more, you know, and, and, and they don't understand sort of that's like shocking or jarring because it's impolite. It's not like, you know, cute and cuddly, but it's real. The real mind science to this, like a drug addict who hits a rock bottom and then finally goes to rehab to change what he's always done to get something different than what he's always got, right? So the mind science behind that is on an individual and mass scale to an unchained ego, the only thing that's going to bring enlightenment is more suffering. We see that happening right now, that the masses have unchained ego. They want the world to be this way. They don't want it to be that way. That's an element of the ego. We want what we want and we will ignore what we don't want. And now suffering must come in order for you to rock bottom, reevaluate what you believe, and then change it to bring it in line with what is unchanging, right? You must bring yourself in line with creation. Creation will not bring itself in line with what you want or don't want to be true. Doesn't matter if it's 7 billion of you doing it. You, okay, so do you, because this is, I, I love this, and, and it's a great segue into the next question I wanted to, to talk about, but it's so true. I do feel like everything that we've been experiencing since 2020 until this present day and moment in time, that we are witnessing a continuous slide towards rock bottom, you know, globally, uh, because there it's like you said, there's almost like an ego temper tantrum being thrown across the globe of what you want and you're not getting it and creating more suffering to awaken or bring in more enlightenment. And it's through the cracks that the light can come in. So do you, do you, cause I, you know, there's so, there's so many different narratives out there. Of course, there's a couple of main ones and they're the opposing ones of one another that we can look at. But this, if there's anything that 2021 has really kind of woken me up to is the need to really stay in the lane of empowerment and to focus on what is going to empower me today versus what is going to distract me and take me um, off of the journey of continued empowerment and knowledge and uh, becoming, you know, what, what we've just been talking about, becoming who I truly am again you've this this idea of um like you know a necessary evil uh i think is important for us to remember when we may find ourselves in resistance you know dark dark against the light and all of that kind of stuff because there is a purpose to everything and the purpose of evil i believe is to show us what we're made of you know to show us um you know, like how dark do we need to go before you actually start standing up for yourself? Sure. And there's even something in the Tao about this that I interpret to, to sort of be, uh, you know, explaining more about this uh, level of understanding, which is something along the lines of what is a good man, but a bad man's teacher? What is a bad man, but a good man's job? Right. So I'll give you the parallel. You go out and I'm not, this is not a blanket statement, demonization of all police. I'm just saying, when you look at my videos or you look at certain things, if you make the parallel, we go out into the world, <clears throat> the police officer is a, that's a good man's job, right? However, what we seem to find a lot of times is bad men, right? Uh, the camera's turned on me now. People may look at me and see me, how I talk, if they know my background. I've been to jail in the past, I, addiction to drugs. You know, I was involved in what society would consider to be criminality, right? So 
um, at this point, I am a bad man's teacher because I've been a bad man, right? The only way you can teach a bad man and help him to heal is well, not all the time, but the best way, right? If you ever go to a prison or somewhere like that and you try to talk to somebody, they're going to say, well, who are you? And why do I want to listen to you? You know, and if you take them through the journey of, well, this is who I am and this is what I've done and this is what I'm doing now. They may be more apt to listen to you than if you walk in there in a business suit and you've done just everything just the right way. They're going to say, well, you ain't me and I can't do that. But if you come to them and you say, well, I am a bad man and I've turned myself into a good man over you know, the course of maybe five or six years and I've completely radically changed my life and the way that I think and how I act and the respect that I have for myself and that I get from others. Do you want that? You know, so. What is a good man, but a bad man's teacher? What is a bad man, but a good man's job, right? So again, mistaking the true for the false and the false for the true because of the perception, right? What we believe we understand, what we think we see, what we, what we want to be true, right? What people have been shown and what they want to be true is when you see someone who looks like this and is dressed like this, that is the good man. When you see someone who looks like this, is dressed like this, that's the bad man. But again. You know, as the cliche says, don't judge the book by its cover and know thyself, know the universe, right? You cannot know right from wrong, good from bad. If you don't truly know yourself, you will always be uh, attracted to or bonded to or mistaking bad or the incorrect or the dysfunctional for what is right and true. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's something that I, uh, uh, given what everything's happening right now is also a major point in uh, coming to awareness is how much false information is floating around us with purpose to confuse us. And ultimately, the answer to that is don't distract yourself with it. Just turn inward. Everything you need is found within anyway, because the truth is resonating there. And, you know, speaking to that point you were talking about with, you know, if someone's been in a really dark place, uh, they're more likely to learn from someone who's also been there is because authenticity speaks to the heart. The heart understands authenticity. And when you can speak from a place that is authentic, you've experienced it, you've you don't just know it, you've, you are it, then someone's more likely to, to listen and resonate with you and, um, show up, show up to class, so to speak. Uh, and, and I think that's one of the things that we don't give enough credit to. And that's an, I think that's another part of what the system that we live in, that many of us are breaking free from and is kind of shattering in its own, through its own demise, is that we're taught that what we need to know comes through certain institutions, certain texts. Um, and once you know a certain amount, that's all you really need to know. And the rest, you just float through life, you know? And I think what we, those of us who are courageous enough to, like I said, step on a different path than the one that is paved for us. For Of course, the paved path is always um, going to come with a lot of consequences. That that path allows you to truly embrace the experience of the teacher and to truly understand who you are. Uh, it's only through leaving the paved path that you actually start to... Uh, start to test yourself in ways that you wouldn't be tested otherwise. Sure. And, and a kind of a big part of this is, <clears throat> and again, I'm not sort of like victiming or blaming anyone else. I'm just saying, however it got that way, however it is. And we can go back to the scripture, the idea of mammon, you know, a society, a whole world, a whole race run by the idea of pursuit of resources. You know, that is their ruling faculty rather than conscience, you know, logic, morals and ethics. So when you have a whole planet who the preponderance, the majority of is ruled by what can I do next to gain something for me and mine, right? Me and mine, another ego construct, my family, my children, my, 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 all, all bodily centric, right? All extensions of my body my property and something that I'm going to ensure and protect and control and, 
you know, but again, we think we're helping, we're actually hurting because the more we pursue things and security, the more it eludes us because the true ability to attain things on the outside and security comes from within. Once again, that's why we see so much insecurity in the world. You'll go out and talk to people and, you know, there's all these different reactive behaviors because people are so insecure, right? Even when they have the suit on and the hair comb just the right way. And here's my degree and here's the car and the trophy wife and all the still you scratch the surface insecurity because the security will never come from without, right? The, the security, true fulfillment, true security, true empowerment comes from within. You could strip everything from me and I can still stand on center, right? On the, on the square, as they say, and I will not budge because I know who and what I am at an essential level. That's where we get the, the things we have and the things we pursue wind up owning us, right? And wind up being our master. Because again, we derive our sense of self by these outward uh, experiences, you know, and that's the, that's the, the best way. I don't care if it comes on your deathbed right before you die, or if it comes, you know, the, the, the time comes whenever it comes, but it will come. If you live by that philosophy and by that state of being, the resistance, the suffering is assured. Right. Because once again, we're buying into we're believing in something that is transient and so it's transitory. It's it's temporary. It's mm -hmm. not as real as we believe it is like. And, I, and I'll just want to kind of bring it over the idea of the currency. When you print up paper money and it's backed by nothing, I don't care how many millionaires and billionaires there are out there. Right. If you are not the source of that system, you are guaranteed to meet suffering. Right. You're guaranteed to meet some kind of loss, injury or harm because you are playing into and buying into and believing into something that by economic law and by universal law is not real and not true. Right. You can't you can't from what I understand as as people, we can't turn a nothing into something. Right. You, you, I mean, we can believe it. You can believe uh, dog coin or the US dollar or whatever, you can believe it has value and maybe we can use it. But at the end of the day, the universe does not recognize that as value. Yes. You know, it's green yeah. paper. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, you know, one, there's a quote that I, um, that I kind of, I'm going to release later today. Uh, and it's this, um, and it's kind of along the lines of what we were just talking there. We you know when we, when you when you reflect a more healed version of yourself out into the world you also will shatter the illusions of those held in others and to <laughs> me i feel like that's kind of what this whole and I, and I, and i don't mean to call it a movement but in a sense it's it's more of a remembrance but those of us who are remembering who we are and remembering our, you know, our universal rights, our God-given rights uh, that were bestowed upon us from the moment we were created, uh, that when we resonate in that more healed state that is also reflecting a power of freedom uh, and knowingness that fear cannot permeate, I feel that that starts to shatter the illusions held within others that are owned by fear. And, and I there's feel- a re And there's a reaction to that, right? Mm -hmm. Like you're, 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 you're hitting it all the way down the line. You're picking up on the subtleties of that. And if you go on my YouTube, you can see that happening right now, that there's certain elements who are now showing up and they're violently angry towards me. And mm -hmm. they're not aware that the reason they're doing that is because I'm a representation of what they are not, mm -hmm. right? I am doing what they will always refuse to do. And they know it subconsciously. They don't know it consciously, but subconsciously they're like, how dare you do something that we've all been trained not to do and have decided we will not do, right? They may even want it, but no, it's taboo. It's against the rules. You are, you are an overthrower of everything, right? And the Tao says this as well. The Tao causes those who think they know to question what they believe, right? So 
when you do that to people, it can be received as, oh, wow, this is magical. This is a miracle. This is loving. This is great. Or it can be, how dare you shut up, go away. We don't, you know, and again, like with Jesus, the allegory, give us yeah. Barabbas, the mob said with one voice, give us the criminal scum, the low life that we've always been used to. We don't want Jesus and the light anymore. Too much. He's, he's a thorn in our side, right? You know, put the thorns on his head. We don't want to hear it anymore because it's a representation of what we could be that we will not be because we will not do. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's often what happens. And uh, it's it's kind of one of the, the it's the it's literally the video topic that I'm going to be doing um, early this week around that and how the projection of um, that shattered illusion, that fear, the, the, the falling apart, feeling like everything is falling apart within you gets then projected onto you because you're the instigator, <laughs> you know, you're you're the one who caused it, it so to speak yeah 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 and and again that's sort of where when you're in that disempowered low self-esteem victim mentality every reaction that you've created inside of yourself that was quote unquote elicited by something outside of you it's their fault they did that right the same way we're seeing now with cancel culture and 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 um you know all of this censorship it's I have a feeling that's generated inside of me, but you did it, right? And again, yeah. it's, it's a lack of self-esteem. Self-esteem comes from within the self and it ends within the self. You cannot affect my self-esteem. It's not possible, right? So if you do or say something that I perceive as affecting my self-esteem, it means there's some issue with inside of me that ends with inside of me. Because mm -hmm. if it's not true, why am I being affected by it? There must be a subconscious rooted belief that it is true, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think that is one of the things that, you know, when you're one, one of the more like the earlier adopters or way showers, you know, of what hasn't yet been accepted through society, the, 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 this is the, I guess you could say the resistance um, that you can meet uh, at times, not everyone's going to be like that. There are going to be people, people, people. There are going to be people who it just it hits them and it, they get it, and it, it's inspiring to them because they're already holding a sense of personal authority and personal responsibility for who they are within. But those who really, I feel, are owned by fear are the ones who are, you know, triggered into feeling shattered within. And then um, don't know, again, it's, it's just experiencing a lot of cognitive dissonance through the illusions coming, being broken. You know, talking about this idea of like, how did we get here? <laughs> what do you think are some of the important things like that have got us to this point that are tangible right now that people can understand and learn how to, for those who are ready, because a lot of people who are watching this, I would say the majority of people who are watching this, they're ready to shift. They're ready to take ownership. They're ready to empower themselves. For you, like what are some of the, what are some of the places or starting points that we need to recover of how we got here? Well, I guess we can start with, right, is uh, if, we're, if we're looking at this principle of what this consciousness inside of this body is doing and what it is we need to start checking our ego and the way we do that is by questioning what we believe so we can start with like taking account right accountability so we have to take account for how did we get here wherever we are now however old we are in this moment way that we think the way that we form relationships and keep that those relationships or destroy them you know we look down our our, our, our life path and take account of cause and effect and then we start to question well what was our home life like you know and it sort of bleeds into certain uh, studies of psychology and sociology but there is some merit to that i believe um what you find a lot of people right especially as they get older or as their parents have uh maybe passed on they are very reticent a lot of times again the ego what we want and don't want to be true they don't want to look they don't want to question they want to keep this image in their mind that their mother, their father was an angel, 
you know, uh, we love them, of course. We would never want to talk bad about them in death. Again, all this polite, cuddly, seeming to be helping and good, feels good, but in the end is destructive to everyone involved in the process because the only way that we can break cycles and become better than those who came before us is by looking at the mistakes made by those individuals impartially, unbiased, objectively, and saying, this is true enough. True enough is... I didn't get the love X, Y, Z that I know I should, you know, have. Right. And that's not, again, we go, we, we vacillate between these extremes, you know, and you'll see certain personality types. They'll say, Oh, here you go again. Now you want to talk about feelings, you know, and what my mommy and daddy did to me when I was five years old, you really think it matters now? I go, look at the way you just spoke to me. It absolutely matters now because the way you were not loved translates into at 60 years old, you not being able to be love able, right? You're not lovable because Mm -hmm. you, you have never experienced love in its truest form and its truest sense without conditions, right? Unconditional love. So, you know, there's, there's sort of many avenues that kind of lead up to one place, but you know, that's sort of the cursory, I would believe, um, Uh, parts of this journey to to reformation within the self is taking account of how you got to where you are at this point in your life. And that means looking at everything that has formed you and your nervous system, right? Our nervous system is formed by what impinges upon it the most. So I don't care if you don't necessarily have a conscious memory of it, or if you don't want to recognize it, there are moments in our upbringing that have impinged and affected and imprinted upon our nervous system that we now carry over into our day-to-day lives. And I just believe it's observable. And the more you talk with people, right, in a therapy sort of setting where you ask them questions and you let them reveal, and the more they speak and reveal, the more they will be shown to themselves, oh, wow, maybe that is an issue. Maybe that was a problem. Maybe that is a form of unhealed or unaddressed trauma that I just need to look at and say, yeah, you know, there's something there and how does it apply to my life today? And how can I realign my perspective by observing myself, right? If you observe yourself in the daily course of your uh, day and your actions, you'll start to pick up on where you're reactive. Those reactive places, that's where that stuff is sitting from. You know what I mean? That's the root of of those decisions, that reactive stuff where you look back and say, well, where did that come from? That wasn't me. No, that's the truest part of you, right? That has been, or at least the, not the truest, but the deep, most deep rooted, right? Because it could be the falsest part of you that really isn't the truest part of you, but it keeps manifesting, keeps showing itself because it's deeply rooted, right? And we do, we revert to in times of trauma or stress, we revert to those places, Mm -hmm. you know, that don't serve us and didn't serve us then and don't serve us now, but are a or what we are taught to be our protective mechanism, right? And you see this, I don't want to ramble on, but uh, you know, you see this a lot in the, you know, I'll take it in my household, uh, the, the typical Italian household, right? Anger is always an acceptable emotion for other emotions that may seem weaker or maybe not as acceptable. It's mm-hmm. always acceptable to be frustrated or angry because that's perceived as strength. So someone taught these people from day one that they have to be strong. You don't always have to be strong. It's okay to not be okay. That's sometimes where you learn the most about yourself. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. You know, as someone who was brought up to be always portray a strength and never a weakness, uh, it is, it has been through my ability to finally show the weaker aspects of myself or the more painful aspects uh, that have allowed me to not only discover the most the most about myself and and make gains like large gains in my understanding of who I am and healing, but also in creating connections with other people, you know, like real connections and really learning what it is to connect with someone from that place that we're taught to not go to um, for so long. And it makes me think of, right, oftentimes people use these certain phrases to communicate an experience 
but not be aware that their perception is evident by the way they're communicating that experience and it is skewed and i'll give you the example Mm -hmm. i can't seem to find love right people say i can't seem to find love i say you don't find love you create love Mm -hmm. and you have to create it with you have to first be love able and create it with someone else who's love able right you cannot find love with other people you've attracted because we attract who and what we are it's the reason you've never found love because you cannot create love within or without because you're attracting an aspect of yourself that is unlovable, right? And this is oftentimes people can't seem to understand or see why they wind up in the relationships they do and why they always end or have the same themes throughout because you are holding something within yourself that is attracting that experience. And until you correct it from within, it will manifest without. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm hmm. 100%. You know, I, I also feel that like one of the, the, the important starting points for people on this journey of re- returning back to their own truth, and remembering the truth that is held within them and held within the universe is kind of looking at boundaries, and also looking at um, convenience and laziness. <laughs> you know, because I feel that well, for one with boundaries, I think that is something that we've just allowed people, many of us have just been been programmed and taught to just kind of give in like, oh, like that doesn't really matter or um, I guess it's okay this time. And so it makes us compliant to a, a, a more, what a more authoritarian type um, energy. But I also feel like convenience and laziness is is something to address as well within your own life. Like, you know, just why, when, when, when do you choose convenience over what could be better for you? You know, or do you choose, a, are you lazy or are you actually putting in effort where you normally wouldn't? And I think that's something, again, that we have to work into because if you start generating uh, from a place that is proactive and you start generating from a place that chooses what's right over what's convenient, then you're going to be in a place that's more empowered to be insistent, like you were saying, um, in standing up for what is just your right, what your truth is. Again, not from a place of resistance, but from a place of um, peace and harmony. Sure. And we can even see these sort of, and again, I'm not making it political. I'm not saying that I even buy into a large part of what the quote unquote women's movements are that are shown to us, right? Because Mm -hmm. there again, there's the true and then there's the false, which one is meant to unite us as men and women under objective truth so we can co-create together with the most desirable experience for us both. And then there's the false, which is meant to divide us so that we cannot truly love and connect because we all we see is differences. Mm -hmm. So, but we see these manifestations right over the last 50 or a hundred years where women have started to insist upon certain things, whether they're true or not. It's the, it's the inward, the crying out saying, I no longer just want to be, part of somebody else's journey and experience, which for a long time, that's what sort of women were to a degree, because society and the way that our world demands and dictates that a man go out and produce a living and a woman stay with the children. And again, we're sort of starting to reimagine or come back to, right, as I think Terrence McKenna talks about this idea of an archaic revival, Man is not supposed to leave the house, go off for eight hours a day. Children are not meant to go off to strangers to be taught. This is all what we want and don't want to be true. So we can come back home at the end of the day in a Benz and sit in a nice big house and say, look what I've done. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's bound to meet resistance. Once again, bound to meet and create dysfunction because children and a family are meant to co-create together. And, you know, and and oddly enough, what you start to notice in people is their children become a burden to them because they believe in this society they've grown up in. Well, I'm supposed to have X, Y, Z amount of time over here and doing this. And that's not reality. See, it is, but it isn't right, because the way it goes down in the tribe is there's everyone on the block living in one big, long house. And you can go off and do that because your extended family is there and we all take care of each other. 
right? We all sort of make love. We all have this communal experience. We all raise the children together and we co-create together. There is not this division, uh, um, uh, um, outsourcing of the idea of family and community. We, we we're now, because of the corporate model, outsourcing family, sending mm -hmm. our kids off to these mass uh, uh, factories to be looked after and raised and taught so that mommy and daddy can pursue busyness, right? The word is business, but it's well busyness. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we're forsaking the next generation over and over again for busyness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this and this kind of comes back like for, I, I'm going to speak from a, my personal experience. Sure. This is my personal journey that, um, you know, I've gone through the spectrum of of in my 20s, believing that I was never going to want children because I was too selfish <laughs> and to getting to a point of realizing I absolutely want to have children. Um, but at the same time, I also want to fulfill some of my own needs. And how can I how can I have that without sacrificing what is of my highest value and what is important to me so that no one is getting the short end of the six, so to speak, so that it's in harmony, you know, that everything is in harmony. And it took, you know, for me, I knew that if I wanted to do that, um, I would probably need like an online business and I would need to form something that I, where I could still kind of jump online when I needed to or wanted to or schedule for myself, but still be very close to my children. And, that took a lot of conviction, a lot of, um, it took a lot of months, if not years of being broke for a little while, but persisting through. I didn't take the easy way out. I had to go past all of the conveniences and, and, you know, some of it was difficult, but I knew what I wanted and I knew what was going to be right for me. And, you know, to finally get to a point where, okay, now, you know, understanding that, to me, time is a major commodity. To me, time is more important than um, money, you know, the, the resource of money. And but time in itself can be um, is, is hollow until you actually put uh, meaning to it and, 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 uh, and you put quality to that time. purpose. Purpose. Exactly. Purpose. Well said. And this whole journey for me is discovering what in my time through me, you know, using this time over the last few years, I want to say five, five, six, seven years of starting to move into this direction of understanding what is the purpose of my time? Where do I feel most purposeful in my time? Where do I not? What can stay? What is just a distraction? What is just a product of what I thought I was supposed to have, like you were talking about and really learning what it is that I value what it is that I want to create here versus what has been um, propagated onto my mind through the years of, you know, school and different institutions and media and all of that. And I think it's important, like I said, that, you know, if we get to this point, well, it's just too hard or I'm too old or um, I don't know how to use a computer or, you know, you can come up with all these different excuses, <laughs> you know, but at the end of the day, you're the creator of what you want. And if there's a will within you, there is a way. Absolutely. And that's sort of the there's a lot of cliches that speak to this, but it's one of those experiences like most really that you can't perceive of it and internalize it and realize it until you're experiencing it, right? Like I'm going through that experience right now of almost finally fully realizing that I can create a life where I not only make a good living, probably better than I did before, um, doing what I know I need to be doing and what I was formed to be doing, and liking who I am and every part of that process along the way. I don't have to come home or even leave home if I don't choose to and seek entertainment or a form of decompressing from being someone I don't like eight hours a day. <laughs> yeah. right? There's this whole big system that continues to operate because people are lacking the understanding of self and how it operates. You mm -hmm. can't go to work eight or nine hours a day, 10, 12 hours a day and be someone different than who you were formed to be and expect to not have to come home, drink drug and stare at a screen 
and 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 sex your way through life because you're unfulfilled and craving something right some form of euphoria happiness fulfillment because you're empty it's again a cliche sort of uh idea you have become an automaton you are a robot a cog and you know uh a spoke in the, wheel. You know, that's it like so once you sort of bring it back and refocus and again reform your life from within and without because thoughts emotions create action and that's what creates the change <clears throat> once that process happens, you start to, and this leads back to the original question, you start to have a different internal makeup and uh, seeking behavior, I guess I would call it, right? Mm -hmm. You're not seeking, you're not desiring, you're not unfulfilled, you're not attaching and addicting and bonding to a whole bunch of things that don't serve you. It's quite the opposite. You're letting go, you know, because now my entertainment, my fulfillment, my joy is derived from what I'm doing. That's a crazy it's a crazy concept, you know what I mean, like to the average person. But my father has always told me, listen, Paul, if you get to the point and you ever get to the point where you do what you love to do, that's when you've made it, you yeah. know, and it's sort of common sense, right? I don't care if it's a baseball player, but see that my ego or whatever it is, my spirit takes it to the next level because I go, even if I love baseball and I was making millions being a baseball player, it's still not as valuable and important as doing the work that I believe that I'm doing right now doesn't even matter how much money is made because this is the work that needs to be done by everybody on the planet right now. If we don't want to go into hell on a deeper level, you see what I'm saying? So, mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I, I love it at this point. You know, at one point I wanted to leave life. I wanted to take myself out of here and never thought that I would be able to find happiness or feel love or enjoy Oh, you just cut out there. Your your sound went out. I uh, there you are. Yeah, Wait. I cut out. I yeah. cut out for a second. Somebody was calling me, but yeah, <laughs> you know, to be to go from that sort of level of darkness, the dark night of the soul, and then come through that and recreate the other side of that for my life, I realized the magic, sort of the um, you know the sort of Hollywood movie nature of reality in a sense. You know, mm -hmm. where we are all writing our story. We are our main character and we are like, you know, Neo in the Matrix. You know, we can be the one, but we have to believe it. Right. Like you said, a key part of your journey is obviously believing in yourself and what you're doing. That has to be there, you mm -hmm. know. And again, we can't really believe in ourselves and what we're doing if we know on some level it's bullshit. Yeah. And truly, we are the alchemists of our own life. So whatever it is that we want to transform, transmute, um, it's it's totally within our, our abilities and our will. Uh, it, it just it's a matter of being able to show up for yourself, which comes which comes which comes into play when you start realizing that journey of like self discovery and self love like you're starting to discover what your true value is and starting to appreciate yourself and starting to embrace all of the parts of yourself, even the darkest parts. And that's probably the most important part to embrace is the darkest part of yourself so that you can pull that in and, and come into a place of acceptance and learn to love what you once hated so that you can now transform it, not from a place because you don't want it, but from a place of knowing that you, you are more, you are more than that. And that is, I think, a really powerful place for us to be creating from. I mean, before we before we end the show, uh, I'd also like to ask you just, you know, just kind of touch on let's talk about authority and um, legitimate authority and what's Ill illegitimate authority, you know, when it comes to understanding, uh, you know, how we operate, who we re who we respond to, who we, uh, you know, who who we answer to. Well, um it seems obvious to me but maybe mm -hmm. not so to a lot of other individuals i'm not sure but there is no such thing as legitimate authority outside of the authority one has been given to govern themselves so there's many like responses and reactions and beliefs and we act on those but from my perception my perspective, there is no such thing as legitimate authority, right? And even go into the word authority comes from author, 
It's somebody who has written something down, right? So anyone who can write something down, it must come from the mind and heart of a man or woman. Well, I happen to be a man and you happen to be a woman. So there is no one in this realm who can raise themselves above us by going beneath us into the paper world, writing something down and having it apply to us. It is an illusion. It is a deception. And it is, again, part of the ego construct of in order to keep everyone safe and create order, we have to avert chaos. And the way we do that is by writing down a bunch of things that we all have written into us and should know to be common sense true, like don't steal, mm -hmm. right? don't kill people. I don't need an author to create authority by writing down on paper that I shouldn't steal something that's not mine. Mm -hmm. God, the universe, I don't even like the term God, the universe, whatever you believe, has already written that into my mind and heart. And if I had any parents worth anything, they would have in, instilled that, reinstilled that into me, that you don't take something that's not yours, right? So again, when we go out into the world and we see the concept and ideas of authority and written laws, it is all from the minds of men and women who want something to be true. It will never be true. The only true authority is the universal law that is written within all of us that you can come to know and to be a part of. And uh, yeah, then we will co-create a kingdom of heaven. If not, we will create hell on earth. And I guess hereafter, I don't really much get into the afterlife because I'm here now mm -hmm. and this is where I make my choices. Mm -hmm. Well, and because, you know, we aren't our body. So, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> uh, and how do you feel? How, okay, what's your perception uh, or understanding? Like, how do you feel about what you're seeing today transpire through society? Um, whether it's just in this state, your, this country, globally, when it comes to humanity and the evolution and the conscious awareness um, rising, how do you see everything playing out? Like, what, what's your general feeling about it all? Okay, and then, yeah, I just want to circle back for a second. <clears throat> Let's also be clear that for all the police and the governmental agents and agencies out there, if they do believe that there is legitimacy to their authority, Let's just remember the fact that the only way they got their authority was by us, the people, allowing them to have that, right? That's what the documentation says. We allow you, because we are the highest thing on this land and in this realm, we allow you to stand in for us to perform certain functions that are supposed to benefit and upkeep the law and the rights and uphold the proper function of society. When you cease to do that, you, 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 there is no longer any idea or concept of authority there. That's what firearms are for, right? And I'm not, I'm not sort of being extreme here. I'm taking you into the mind of an extremely streetwise spiritual individual like someone who would be in their early 20s who fought five wars already, mm -hmm. like, you know, George Washington or some of the founders. And they will tell you, we'll allow you to play authority and play king and play God. Sure, go ahead and do it. But as soon as you start buying into that play and believing it, right, and forgetting who and what you are and how you got there and that it was from us, we will take you out, right? If we have to, we're loving men, we're faithful men, we're good men and honorable men. We don't want to be involved in any of this nonsense. You are all choosing this, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So like I tell them, I hope I never have to be a part of anything like that. Because if we ever get to physical conflict, we've all already lost. We've mm -hmm. all already become something beneath who and what we are at our truest level. But again, it's cause and effect. You know, mm -hmm. if you buy into and believe you have authority over anyone else, I don't care if it's your wife, you believe you have authority over your wife, there's going to be a problem at some point because it's not reality. Yeah. You know, so. But you, you were saying, as far as <laughs> I remember correctly, because I just wanted to make it clear. That yeah, no, I. Say, well. We need authority. We need these police. We need all this to keep order, whatever. That's fine. I'll even go as far as to say, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll buy into that. But it has to be based on the codification in the Constitution of universal law, which is all men and women here are created equal and powers are given over in order to maintain a certain civil function. Yeah. You know, but well, you said, where do I see this all going? Right. Okay. It's cause and effect like anything else. The preponderance of the individuals in this realm will either raise their frequency and their their consciousness and their level of understanding so they can see further and they will be able to co-create. Right. That's why we sort of 
uh, say higher consciousness because as we rise in consciousness like climbing a pole we can see further right so we can see further ahead down the line what's coming and we can start to co-create and respond rather than react right responsibility so we're all going to have to come truly become truly response able to what the universe and the world and and this country is showing us we're going to have to respond to that in a way that is in line with what's true or else the deception will continue to cause more suffering i know that that's not a <clears throat> popular view for a lot of people they want to say well it's all going to be okay something or someone or you know it's just going to magically come and change it all no i think that we are going to degenerate into revolution which means complete circle to revolve we're going to generate uh, degenerate like we have done in every society into armed revolution uh, forming complete circles because we will not seek resolution <clears throat> we will not seek the truth understand the truth come in line with universal law and resolve all the problems that we are creating for ourselves through resisting truth. Right. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, it's cause and effect. Yeah. Yeah. What do I, and, and, and if you're asking me then the next question, what do I believe is going to happen? I don't know. And no, I yeah. sort of have a more negative. Um, I'm not exactly, I haven't accepted one way or the other, but I'm not exactly hopeful at this point of mm -hmm. what's going to happen because I've seen too much compliance, too much fear for too long in the face of too much nonsensical, illogical ridiculousness. Right. <clears throat> so, but again, I can only do what I can do and for my soul journey and, and who I've been to who I am now and to what I'm being, what I'm now a part of that is fulfilling. And that's all that I need. I don't need to uh, fear or worry about, anyone outside of me because I can't control it anyway mm -hmm, right so mm -hmm. I surrender that and I allow that to be everyone's journey and at some point if I have to I will suffer along with everyone else for the choices that other people have made I mean that's just part of the 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 the, the connectivity of this realm right there is no separation of the collective outcome yeah I do feel though, like for my, from what my sense is, just from what I'm perceiving and observing and sense within my own heart is that, like you said, we're in a place of necessary evil and I think it is serving a purpose. Now, how that plays out, I don't think any of us know and, and any of us who pretend to know, I think is again, um, is an, is an untruth because there's so many factors. There's so many factors that um, create that. But I do see that it's all playing out, I think, in the way that it's designed to for everything that we've chosen for this lifetime in whatever way we're going to learn. And I think that, you know, whatever we do choose will help dictate how we experience things. Sure. I mean, if nothing else, I will have the ability to cope with whatever comes, assuming it's something negative, right? Like if we <clears throat> are saying, well, what are we worried about or what are we fearful about on some level? I mean, there's obviously, you know, archetypal fears and drives that this flesh body has. But, you know, the spirit and this the state of that understanding of cause and effect, I think, allows one to cope with what seems like to a lot of other people to be just complete chaos that makes no sense. And, you know, to me, <clears throat> everything is as it should be. So even when I'm a part of that sort of suffering process, I'm not choosing suffering, right? Mm -hmm. I understand that there is a level of, I can't really call it anything else other than sort of bondage and slavery that is is manifesting outside of us because the individual is in bondage and slavery not only to their belief systems but to their vices <clears throat> their chains in this world so um yeah it gives me a clarity and a compassion and an understanding that allows me to weather the storm and also to become better um while it seems other people are breaking down and that's not like a competition i'm not like happy or, you know, egotistical about that. 
I'm just more sort of surprised, if anything else, because of how I used to be and where I was yeah. and how I couldn't even, you know, go to the store without having an emotional breakdown in certain ways. And now to be able to see the whole world having an emotional breakdown around me at the store and be able to cope with that and internalize that and say, well, I'm going to be OK. And I know who and what I am and what I'm doing and what I'm a part of. And it doesn't matter how many of these individuals think that putting three masks on injecting chemicals into their bloodstream, locking down in their home in a supposed free society for a virus that has a 99% survival rate. I mean, all of these levels of madness that I'm, it's okay now. I'm okay because I prepared for this and I was formed for this and I made a journey uh, with this information, this understanding for probably a decade now. Yeah. So, yeah. you know. And well, let's just put it this way. You know, com considering where you've come from, you were shown what you are capable of through that. And I think that there are many people are discovering this at this current time. They're starting to discover, you know, what they're capable of. Now, of course, that's going to be presenting at varying levels, depending on where someone's at in their own journey and um, discovery of self. But I that that is happening. And so, I mean, I like to say, if there's hope for you or someone else who's been in those really dark places, then there's hope for a lot of people. Uh, and, and perhaps this is really just the dark night of the soul, <laughs> a global dark night of the soul that many of us um, are kind of weathering the storm, like you said. But given the tools and the experience and the knowledge and the wisdom that we've attained um, along the way already is equipping us to be, be light posts, you know, instead of... Um, trying to scramble for cover <laughs> well what like what you just said right <clears throat> the idea of being capable you will never know <clears throat> what you're truly capable of until you're forced to attempt it mm -hmm. right and the majority of us will not attempt what we don't believe we're not capable of but yeah. being forced into that right like the same sort of allegory and and it kind of comes to mind i don't know why but the idea of fight club or certain sort of um, situations where you're forced into the ring, right? Almost like this law, common law thing. I, it shows me in a sense, I was forced into the ring. So yeah. I may not have believed I could do it or whatever, but get me in the ring and put my back against the wall. Like it says, the true colors, the true character of a man or woman is shown when they're given power or when their back is against the wall. So you will never know what you're truly capable of until you have no other option but to attempt what you believe is impossible mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that's just the way the human nature is until we're pushed to our limit <laughs> we don't budge <laughs> and it's sort of a beautiful thing like we thrive under pressure uh we we sort of we don't wake up you know it's kind of the primate if you believe and i don't necessarily believe in that or not but you know we are loving sort of like the gorilla you know we're loving we we take care of our children we don't really want problems, but you wake us up and you're going to get a problem, you know? So yeah. it's kind of like, I guess it's, it's, it's an ability to navigate in a world and be loving and compassionate and not like, you know, harm people around you while at the same time having that ability to turn it on when it's necessary. The, the key is, um, I guess into every individual has a want or, or, a. a they want it to be true when that time is necessary, right? Like for me, that time was long ago. Like, okay, yeah. it's time to wake up now. It's time to act. It's necessary. Other people are like, oh, it's okay. It's going to give. And I'm like, no, <laughs> you know, when you're, when you're at this point, it's time to act. So yeah, we have to wake up and stop being so polite and uh, start standing on what we know to be right and true and let everyone else be damned, so to speak. Yeah, exactly. Um, exactly. So it, this has been a great conversation. I've really enjoyed it, Paul. Um, and I, I know the audience uh, is loving it as well. Can you um, please let uh, the audience know where they can um, find you, like different platforms and if they need to reach out to you? Sure. So um, I got the YouTube. It's uh, it's Paul Unslaved, I-T-S, Paul Unslaved. And then um, I got my Facebook uh, it's Paul Pablo Remington Jones. Um, I got a telegram too, but that information is on the YouTube. So yeah, pretty much right now I'm, um, YouTube centric.
for you better too, yeah. or for worse. So <laughs> till they till they throw me off or uh, you know shadow ban me, the dreaded shadow ban. Yeah, uh, everyone's been talking to me about that lately. But you know what it is, what it is. Yeah. Well, I think Telegram is kind of, a, a, at least at current time, it's a safe bet right now, at least so that if anything happens, you can use it to like let people know where you're at, what happens, um, all of that. So uh, I'm going to leave all the links for everything that you just dropped uh, in the description below. And I know the mods will be have been dropping all those links in the live chat um, later on. So thanks so much, Paul, for coming on the show. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I, of course, found it inspiring. I hope many of you watching and listening uh, have found it inspiring to empower yourself and to remember your truth that is embedded within your DNA and the consciousness of the universe. Uh, for us to remember and start acting upon, not from a place, like you said, of resistance, but from a place of insistence that is based in peace. So I love you guys so much. Have a wonderful evening and I'll be back with you guys next week.